The Twilight Zone, the grandfather of all notable sci-fi tropes, cliches, and devices. What we are attempting to do today is identify every single new idea that Rod Serling introduced to the world of film, television, and altogether storytelling. Every idea that would be an inspiration for, and often imitated, replicated, and blatantly copied by all that would come after. Let's take a journey. Episode 1. The first episode, entitled Where Is Everybody, was first broadcast on October 2nd, 1959. It introduces a multitude of sci-fi devices that the world would come to know, love, and even hate in due time. Black Mirror, I Am Legend, Star Trek, all borrowed from this single episode. Its opening narration's intentions are clear. The place is here. The time is now, and, and the, the journey, journey into, into the, the shadows, shadows that we're about, about to watch could be our journey. So we're all on the same page. The story that we're about to watch, albeit science fiction, is supposed to be relatable. Got it. The scene opens with a man walking down a sandy path toward a building marked Cafe. The man appears to be wearing a jumpsuit, perhaps a mechanic's uniform? No, wait, it's more like a pilot's coveralls. No one is in the cafe. No one is anywhere in town. What the hell? Where is everybody? He wanders the city, trying desperately to find another human. Whenever he enters a room, it appears everyone has just left it. A cigarette will be smoking in an ashtray. The water will be running in a sink. He can't stand the feeling of isolation. This is the heart of the story. So, what do we have here? Well, it's a pretty classic case of the sci-fi trope, the last man on earth, with elements of the subtropes, the aloner, and the vanished. The protagonist of the story is inexplicably all alone, generally in a place where there should be a lot of people. New York City, a suburban neighborhood, Generally, the plot revolves around their quest for survival, scavenging for food or fighting off zombies, but what usually ends up being the worst enemy, however, is pure loneliness. Pure loneliness. Now, one of the main devices of this trope is abnormal ways of communicating verbally. AKA, which inanimate object is the protagonist gonna talk to so that the audience has any idea what's going on in their head? Now, this device is mainly needed for the visual medium. If this were a book, for example, we could simply read the thoughts going on in their head. But even in the 1950s, having a character monologue to an empty room was just lazy writing. In a television show or a movie, we need something to get them to talk out loud and without it being contrived. For this episode, we have what was at the time an incredibly original, creepy, believable human substitute. Mannequins. That's right, mannequins. Our forgetful, lonely pilot spots what he believes to be a woman and proceeds to verbalize everything in his head to her. You're the first person I've seen. Look, I really don't want you to be frightened or anything, but I was wondering if there's a doctor or Before realizing that she is, in fact, a store mannequin sitting in a van labeled mannequins, in case we were confused. Now, if this sounds familiar, you're not crazy. You're probably thinking of I Am Legend, one of the more famous adopters of this trope. In this film, Will Smith's character wanders around New York City all alone, trying to survive the physical dangers of the night while also combating his own crippling loneliness. Who does he talk to? Mannequins, creepy, Mannequins. It is hard to ignore the similarities in the plot of these two stories. Now, you might also know that I Am Legend is based off a book, and that book was written by Richard Matheson, and that that book came out in 1954, five years before the release of this episode. Does this mean the Twilight Zone didn't popularize this device? Well, guess what? I read that whole dang book, and there are no mannequins. The book relies on, as previously mentioned, third person omniscient narration. Mannequins are obviously not the only choice to battle the conundrum of a protagonist with no one to talk to. Other children of the last man on earth or one is the loneliest number tropes have taken to other human substitutes. In the beloved Tom Hanks rom-com Castaway, we have the volleyball Wilson or see the Omega Man 
the classic 1971 sci-fi starring Charlton Heston about, you guessed it, the last man on earth. He does most of his dialoguing with a bust of Caesar. Hmm. There is another subtrope at play here, the forgetful hero. Our lonely pilot is not just lonely, he's an amnesiac of sorts. He can't remember anything, how he got to this town, what his name is, he even has to confirm that he's American by looking at the dollar bills in his pocket. Well, we got that much settled, I'm an American. This is a very common device in sci-fi stories to make ordinary things seem strange and alien. Suddenly a quaint little town becomes mysterious this, however, is the first successful rendition of this trope on television. It's been used countless times since to create an intriguing and empathetic protagonist because we learn things about them at the same moments they do. The woman in the episode White Bear from season two of Black Mirror. John Murdoch from the cult classic Dark City. The protagonist Jake Lonergan of Cowboys and Aliens. The lead in Demon with a Glass Hand, one of the most famous episodes of The Outer Limits, another sci-fi anthology of the 1960s, and Twilight Zone's arch nemesis. Their episode, however, came out in 1963. Now about 85% of the episode is our lonely pilot attempting to find another human in this mysterious town of Oakwood. He answers a ringing phone to find no one on the other end. He uses a police radio. He searches a movie theater, a bookstore, where he finds a book entitled The Last Man on Earth. He's really losing it now. He runs around town. He runs into a mirror. Ouch. He runs into a bike. Ouch. Before ultimately cracking from the loneliness and the undeniable feeling that he is being watched. This is about the time where the Twilight Zone introduces the twist. It's not every episode, but more often than not, some twist happens in the last few minutes that subverts the mystery on its head. It turns out they were on Earth the whole time, or that goateed man is actually the devil. In this case, we're expecting to find out what crazy supernatural thing is plaguing this haunted ghost town. After 19 minutes and 22 seconds, we finally see another living creature. We actually see several. Huh, it turns out, and this was a simulated trip to the moon, is that right, General? For all intent and purpose, yes. Our pilot was simply in a military test to see how long a man can go alone in a small vessel before he cracks. After having been confined to a five-foot box for 484 hours, this astronaut in training broke down and what we had just witnessed for 20 minutes was none other than the classic trope, all just a dream. Now, I'm not gonna sit here and claim that the dream sequence was popularized by the Twilight Zone. Those have been around for a while. But to have a significant portion of a television show or film be presented as truth only to find out that it was the visual representation of a brain gone haywire, that began with this episode. We have the psychotic hallucinations of American Psycho, the video game realities of the episode playtest from season three of Black Mirror, several episodes of Star Trek, the entire plot of Jacob's Ladder, even the Adam Sandler masterpiece Click. All of these spawned from this one episode of The Twilight Zone. It bears mentioning that this episode, the first Twilight Zone episode, is very unusual. By the end of the episode, it turns out to be not science fictional at all. All of the events of the episode are explained easily by the final four minutes. It wasn't real. It was just his imagination. There are 156 episodes of the original Twilight Zone. This episode is one of only four that don't contain fantastical elements. Four. Looking back at it now, we can see how this episode breaks from the mold of typical Twilight Zone episodes, which are fully science fictional, supernatural, or horrific. But remember, this was the pilot episode. For all the viewers new in 1959, every episode of this show was going to be just like this, set perfectly in reality, no sci-fi plots that can't be explained by the final reveal. How wrong they would be. How wrong they would all be.
Hey guys, Justin from Inverse here. Thank you so much for watching. That was a ton of fun to make that video. Researching and writing it, I felt like a, a mini Rod Serling for a moment, which is my dream. And if you enjoyed the video, please make sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Comment below with what video you wanna see next. And if I missed anything, please let me know. I know you probably caught something that I missed, Kathy from North Dakota. All right, I'll catch you guys next time in the Twilight Zone. Right there. That's my head. Right? Hopefully. I'm the one who has to edit this, so hopefully I got it to work and make it look cool. What's up, me? Maybe. Alright, later.